Due to technical issues, the last seven minutes of today's sermon will be audio only. We apologize for any inconvenience. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Redemption Bible Church in New Braunfels, Texas, where we are proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology. We pray that this message will be a blessing to you as you seek to worship Christ, walk with Christ, and work for Christ, all to the glory of God. For more information about our church, please visit redemption.bible. Thanks for listening, and we hope to see you soon at one of our upcoming worship services. Um, But yeah, I'm really excited to be able to dive into God's Word with you. Um, We're going to continue on in the book of John, and so if you brought your copy of God's Word, you can go ahead and turn to John chapter 12. We're continuing this series on the book of John, and that's where we're going to be. But while you're turning there, uh, I want to just ask a, a quick question. And, uh, you know, well, before I get there, um, we'll dive into it. Let's do it. Okay. How many of you have upgraded a computer or a cell phone? You've ever upgraded one? Okay. Awesome. Isn't that a great feeling? Like, uh, as a former teacher, I remember having a computer that I couldn't even get my emails to load. Like, it would take forever just for the email to pop up. And uh, as a teacher, you don't have a ton of time. Um, And so when you get the time to do it, you're trying to knock it out as quickly as you can, right? And when I got that new computer, all of a sudden, I'm just like burning all cylinders, right? Or uh, I think of a cell phone. So I'm a a millennial. I'm a 1988 born baby. Um, And so when I got my first cell phone, um, I was in middle school. Well, actually, it wasn't my phone. It was my mom's phone. She let me use it, you know? Um, And it was a Nokia phone with no color um, and... To, to send a text message, you had to, like, push the button a thousand times just to say, you know, like, I'm on my way, and it'd take you 10 minutes to do that, right? Um, and then I remember upgrading, and I got a, T, a phone with T9 texting, if you remember that. Um, I was in school, and I loved it because I could text in my pocket because I figured out the algorithm for T9, um, and so I could do the things I wasn't supposed to do in school. Um, and so that's why, as a teacher, I was really good at teaching because I knew how kids try to get away with everything. But, um, yeah, upgraded T9, and then I got a a, a scr- uh, one that slid, it had a keyboard, right? And now, oh my goodness, now I'm texting like super fast, right? And then, then you get one with a, you know, when you upgrade things, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome to get things that are better. What about a, a printer? How many of you guys remember the dot matrix printers? Raise your hand if you remember a dot matrix printer. You might remember if I start explaining it. It's like it had the perforated sides and you could peel those off. That was the most satisfying thing. It was like popping bubble wrap as a kid, right? You would just be able to pull that perfectly off. But there was a lot of work that went into the process. You had to like load the paper into the little rails and line it up. And then it would take, like for a sermon like this, it would probably take 15 minutes to print this, right? But my dad was a computer guy. He was a computer geek. He owned a computer business, and I had one. We had one in the house. And I thought it was the coolest thing of all time. Like, I'd have my friends over be like, hey, dude, check this out. It prints what's on the computer. Now I printed this in five seconds flat, and I would never go back to a dot matrix printer ever, right? But it's always a great feeling to get something that's just simply better. When we get something that's better. And so today we're going to talk about something that is better than all of those things. And we'll be guided by John in the 12th chapter of his book, starting in verse 1. We're going to pack this to see that Jesus is simply better. That Jesus is better. And I want to first start off by saying every time I get the opportunity to preach, uh, I always want to remind everybody in the room that we are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And we are in desperate need of salvation that comes through Christ alone. With that reminder, let us take a humble heart into prayer and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word this morning. Um, Lord God, we pray that you would fill this place, that the words that we receive this morning would not just be words on a page, but they would speak deeply to our, our soul, that your spirit would be among us and bring us understanding for the words that we're going to receive that your spirit would bring uh, to light what your desire is from us in this passage and and how we are to take that and apply it to our daily life. Lord, I pray that we do not come here this morning with no anticipation of you moving, 
but we come with great anticipation that you're going to move in our lives and change us to be more like you. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be reading John chapter 12, starting with verse 1 and ending in verse 19. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come from the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done the sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And as Blair would say, this is God's word for God's people. So I want to look at the context of this passage real quick. Okay? The first 11 chapters of the book of John are are walking us through the life of Christ. They're, They're walking us through the life of Jesus. And here in chapter 12, we're seeing a shift, a a shift, a pivot to one week. Okay? So now we're looking at just one, the last week, the one week before Jesus sacrifices himself. The last Sabbath. We saw last week in chapter 11, if you guys were with us, that Lazarus was raised from the dead and the news spread all over and it was known by many people. So we can see that in verse 45 of chapter 11 where it says, many had seen and believed what Jesus had done. And in this chapter it says, a large crowd came to see Jesus and to see Lazarus. And so we conclude that this was something that was well known by the people. The chief priests had heard about it, people in the area had heard about it. And the resurrection of Lazarus is what increased the number of people following Jesus. But that same resurrection is what led to a plot to take Jesus' life as well. This passage, in short, is preparing us for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our King. The man who would die for all of our sin. The one who would save you and I from an eternity apart from him. A sacrifice that was better than any other. So I've titled this sermon this morning, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And I want to stress, there is nothing that we can have on this earth that is better or greater than Jesus. Again, there is nothing we can have that is greater than Jesus. So we're going to look at verse 1 through 3 a little deeper, and we're going to see how Mary starts us off by demonstrating that there is nothing that she has on this earth, there's nothing she has that is greater than Jesus. So verse 1 starts six days before the Passover, and so we know this was most likely a Saturday because Passover began on Friday, 
right? So we, we sang, you know, Friday is good because Sunday's coming, right? So we know this would have been on a Saturday, six days before the Passover. Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Okay, so Jesus went to the place where he raised Lazarus from the dead, right? He went there knowing that they were looking for him. The, the, the distance of Bethany to Jerusalem would have been like from here to downtown New Braunfels, right? So really, really close in proximity to where Jerusalem was. And we know that this time Jesus wasn't moving around freely. If you were with us last week in chapter 11, it says, Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to a region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. So he, he withdrew. So we know there was some, some tension in the air around Jerusalem, right? Jesus withdrew knowing that I can't just openly walk among the people right now. We know that Jesus had said many times, now is not yet my time, not as yet my time, and he would escape, right? There were times where they were trying to get him, and he would make it through. It was not his time yet. But that did not stop him from going to Passover. It didn't stop him from going to Bethany right outside Jerusalem. Like, I think about, like, if you committed a crime, the last place you want to be is the place you committed the crime in, right? But he goes right back to the place where he performed the miracle that would lead them to say, no more. Jesus was bold and did the will of his Father regardless of the risks. May this be a reminder to each of us to assess our lives and ask ourselves, are we seeking to do the will of the Father or are we allowing the spirit of, the, of fear to hold us back? Are we truly seeking to do the will of the Father? Like, that's what His will is for me, and, and I'm looking for it. Or do I let the spirit of fear, the spirit of comfort, keep me from doing those things? So let's look what happened when Jesus arrived in Bethany. It says, So they gave Him a dinner. They gave a dinner for Him there. And Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with Him at the table. And Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. So this section of the passage here, and if you're, if you're familiar with how the Gospels work, they're, they're accounts of each person, right? And so some of them have the same story from the perspective of, of who wrote it. And so in Matthew's account in chapter 26, it tells us this occurred on a Sunday at Simon the leper's house. Now, Simon would have been someone who would have been healed by Jesus, right? That's why he's no longer a leper, which is why they're in his house, because they wouldn't have gone to his house otherwise. And he would have done this out of, of deep gratitude for what the Lord had done. He would have had a, a house that was suitable to host, and he wanted to show that gratitude to the Lord. Also, we see Martha, we see Mary, we see Lazarus, who all had the same thing. Mary and Martha would have been so excited to welcome Jesus back, and to, to be in such grateful hearts and have such gratitude towards him for raising their brother from the dead. And of course, Lazarus was probably pretty happy, right? Because he went from being dead to being made alive and even, even being able to share a meal. And so these people would have been there out of gratitude for what Christ had done for them. And I find it fascinating that Jesus chose these people to have his last moments with. They didn't realize these were Jesus' last moments, but he knew. So you have Simon the leper, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and some of the disciples. Can you imagine what the table conversations would have been like in that room? Like if I could have just been a fly on the wall just to like listen in. And, and them sharing the stories like, Jesus, remember that time you like came walking on the water? Yeah, and Peter, you almost drowned? Like what a loser. I told you not to look away right? I hope they would talk like that. I don't know if they did. They probably didn't, but you know, my personality, I would get along with them better that way, right? Or like, hey, Lazarus, remember when you died? <laughs> like, you were dead, bro. And she's like, oh, no, he's cool. I'll, I'll raise him later, you know? Like, can you imagine what that would have been like in that conversation, the, the joy that they would have had, the, the laughter, having no idea what was to come? 
Or, or like, I love the like mic drop on Philip when Philip's like, oh, how can you feed these 5,000 people with just two fish and five loaves of bread? And he's like, just watch, right? Like, just a mic drop moment for Jesus, right? Oh, man, I would have loved to listen to that conversation. Now, I want to point out something very significant that happened in these verses, y'all. And what we're going to see is going to lead me to my first point. What you value on this earth shows what you believe. What you value on this earth shows what you believe. You see, Mary here anointed Jesus' feet with pure nard. And nard is a very rare herb that would have been grown in like China, Tibet, somewhere far away. This was not something you just go down to Walmart and grab, y'all, okay? This would have been something that had a, a lot of value. Some say it could have potentially been like her life savings, like, like we talk about retirement. Like this would have been like something that was so valuable, financial security for her. Matthew's account says it was in an alabaster jar that would have been used at burials to hide the stench of a dead body or maybe even watered down to, to make the aroma in a house pleasant. It, it, if we look at the, the pound of nard, it would have been about the size of a Dr. Pepper can. So if you can just kind of like picture in your mind a Dr. Pepper can, that's about how big that alabaster jar would have been. Um, having about 12 ounces. And in Mark's account, it says something that really stood out to me. And so this is why I always encourage you, whenever you read through the Gospels, read through all of them. Because they pick out different things. Mark's account says... She takes the alabaster jar and she breaks it. She didn't take the jar and just say like, oh, I'm just going to pour just enough to cover his head and just enough to cover his feet and I'm going to save the rest for later. No, she takes it and she breaks it and pours it over his head, all that she has. Every ounce, every drop, no intent of it staying in the jar because the jar is now broken. She takes it, she breaks it, she pours it over his head. It drips down his head, through his beard, onto his body, into his feet. And she gets down like a servant, and she undoes her hair. And she starts to wash his feet with her hair, with all that she has. Man. She broke it. She saved nothing, no intent. Her heart was that there was nothing that had value on this earth, nothing that had value in her world more than Jesus. And not only did she sacrifice one of her most valuable earthly treasures, but by unbinding her hair as a, as, as a woman at this time, it would have been breaking cultural and social norms. She didn't just sacrifice possession, but she sacrificed reputation and showed much humility to honor her king. Mary's heart was that nothing had value compared to Jesus. Nothing. Nothing had worth in comparison to the Messiah that she knew he was. And she was anointing him for what was to come. The death, burial, and a resurrection of the Messiah, who has been anticipated for centuries. Now is the time, y'all. Now is the time. It's coming. It's coming. And Mary knew he was who he said he was. And her actions demonstrated that. You see, what Ma Mary valued on this earth was Jesus above all things. This shows she truly believed he was the Messiah the one who came to save the world, to save you and me, church. He was better than her most valuable possession, her reputation. He was better. The heart of Mary here helps guide us into the second point of the sermon this morning. And the second point is, a self-serving heart equals death. But a humble and sacrificial heart leads to resurrected life that glorifies God. A self-serving heart is destined to death, but a humble and sacrificial heart to Jesus 
leads to a resurrected life that glorifies God. Now let's take a look and see what Judas brings to the table here. We're going to see a contrast in Mary's heart. Her humble, sacrificial heart, we're going to see a contrast to when Judas enters in here. So in verse 4, we see the conjunction, but. If you ever see that conjunction in your Bible, circle it, buckle up, get ready, because there's going to be a shift. There's going to be a transition here that you're going to want to pay attention to. So we just saw this amazing pour out of love for Jesus. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. You see, he knew the value of that nard. He was aware. We just had a, a family over, one of the kids that used to be in my youth group at my old church. Um, he's an entrepreneur, okay? A 16-year-old entrepreneur. But this kid, he can go into a thrift shop and find a pair of jean shorts, right? And buy them for $5. And he sells them online for $150, it's like, I didn't even know George was still a thing, you know? But this kid at, at, at such a young age can go into a thrift store and know what the value of things are. Judas knew what the value of things were on this earth. He was a money guy, right? And he made it very clear that he was also using this for personal gain. So if we look at 300 denarii, denarii a denarius would have been like a day's wage for an average person, okay? So... Uh, maybe like a teacher makes like $50,000 a year, right? So it would have been about a year's worth of wages, okay? So we see Judas looking at this and questioning. He demonstrates a worldly heart, a heart that says worldly things do have value in comparison to Jesus. Like, why are you wasting this on him? We could have used it for the poor or myself, Right? So we must ask ourselves, where do we stand here? You see, in, in Matthew's account in chapter 26, verse, verse 8, it even says that other disciples started to chime in because Judas started it off. So not only did he speak and start to question what was happening, but he rallied others to question. And so my question for you today and that I think we need to ask ourselves is, are we rallying others against the will of God because it is against something we personally desire, because it could potentially impact our status, our acceptance? Do we truly believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfillment of prophecy, our Savior? Look, we've all been there. We've been in an uncomfortable position when religion or Christ or the Lord comes up. And in that moment, we've got to make a decision. Do we sit in that comfortable, like, I'm just going to be cordial here and try to, like, bypass this conversation? Or am I going to be bold and say that Christ has value above all things? I used to be a teacher. And there was teachers that were terrified to talk about Jesus in the school. Terrified. They would never talk about it. What great joy to be fired for talking about Jesus, right? Like, I'm not telling teachers to go and be start preaching to your kids and stuff, right? I get it. But if a kid asks you a question, you have every right to be able to share it with them. If you have a friend that brings it up, you have every right as their friend who truly loves them to share it with them. If you have a coworker and they don't want to hang out with you anymore because you talked about Jesus, that's what you're worried about? We can't be rallying others against the will of God. Or maybe it's a personal thing, like, like you don't want your spouse to take that job, even though you know it's the will of God. You don't want to serve in that ministry, even though you know it's the will of God. Ah, but it's going to take me away from, you know, fishing on Saturdays, you know? Oh, man, but duck season's coming up, deer season's coming up, and that's not a good time for me to serve, Lord. Right? I've been there. I've been there. We have to continue to assess ourselves and say, do we truly believe that he is the Messiah, that he is greater and better than everything else? You see, John 12, 5 that we read were the first words spoken by Judas. 
words that questioned God's will. And the reason why is because it threatened Judas's personal gain. Words that were self-serving and did not speak life, but would ultimately lead to his own death. But praise God, Jesus rebukes him here in verse 7. And Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So I feel like now I don't want to be in that room anymore. Like I liked all the like stuff beforehand where they were like, you know, laughing and stuff. And now I don't want to be in that room anymore. Because there now is like some tension where they're all starting to question what's happening to the Lord. They don't understand it. They don't get why it's happening. And Jesus rebukes them and is telling them again, you're not going to always have me. There would have been some tension here. You see, the love that Mary was showing Jesus was an intimate love. When she was down on the floor, what she was doing was an, a sign of intimacy with the Lord. She, so, she showed humility like a servant and held not one drop back. Mary believes in her heart because she knows Jesus is the Messiah. She's not set on her own desires. She knows Jesus is better. But this belief led Judas to question what she was doing. And it shows his self-serving, hateful heart in contrast to her sacrificial, loving heart. We see an example of a self-serving heart being destined to death. Judas led, leading himself to his own death. But the humble, sacrificial heart of Mary leading to a resurrected life that glorifies God. We see the hate of Judas, the devil, the chief priest, in contrast to the love that Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Simon the leper, these people at this dinner had. And Matthew and Mark's accounts show us that after Jesus rebuked him, he, Judas immediately went to the chief priest to cash in on Jesus. Can you believe that? immediately when he left that room, he was like, you know what? I'm going to go cash in on Jesus. If I don't get my money from here, I'm going to get it from somewhere. Judas would have been acting because he was upset and acting out of emotion. Look, I'm a married man, y'all. I got a three-year-old girl. I got an 18-month-old girl and a pregnant wife. Okay? There's some emotions going on in our house. Okay? And normally when we operate out of emotion... What comes out of it is an apology, okay? Many times when things get, get going, we get flustered and we say or do something out of an emotion that we're feeling and it ends up in regret. So we have to be careful to figure out what we're feeling. Is that, is that of God? Is that from God? And if it's not, to give it back to him. But here Judas did not. He went straight to the chief priest to cash in. We're probably all guilty of this at times. We act and do things out of feeling from our sinful flesh. It's in us. Rather than turning them back to the cross. You see, we know Judas would regret this. We know this led to regret because Matthew helps us see that in, in chapter 27. He actually tries to return the silver. The silver that was paid to Judas, he goes and tries to return it because of the regret that he had. And that leads to Judas' last words, which were, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. So Judas' first words, questioning the will of the Lord and rallying others against it to his last words before he takes his own life, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Such a contrast to his first but regardless of Judas' opposition or the opposition of those that chimed in, Jesus was anointed in preparation for what was to come, his death, burial, and resurrection. And praise God, Jesus is better than any opposition. His will will continue. We can try to, to be self-serving. We can have those thoughts and feelings, but Jesus knows Jesus shows up and he's greater. 
So let's look at the next section that helps us guide us through this week leading up to the Passover, okay? Verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So my third point on your your notes there. Third point, you are living a life inviting others to see the value of Christ or plotting to raise your own value. You are living your life inviting others to see the value of Christ or plotting to raise your own value. See, you are either living your life inviting others to come and see the goodness of God, to come and taste and see that God is good, or you're plotting to raise your own status, your own value in this life, which will ultimately lead people away from Christ. They want to be more like you rather than more like Him. You see, many times we get caught up on that. Here we see a large crowd of Jews that came to see Jesus. It says, a large crowd came to see him, and the Gospel of John started in the very first chapter telling us, come and see. And for those of you who stick around and want to hear me talk some more um, for the vision mission um, dinner, we're going to talk about that come and see, where it started in the book of John, where Jesus told them, come and see where I'm staying. Philip told Nathaniel to come and see. Oh, how different this world would be if the church, if we would just invite people to come and see that God is good. Every one of you come to his word because you have tasted and seen that God is good. We need to be inviting others to have a taste of that as well. And not just inviting them to church on a Sunday but through every interaction we have with them, no matter where we are. But instead of coming to see, the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death so other Jews would not see him alive. You see, by Lazarus being alive, it was a testament that he was raised from the dead. But if they would just kill him and he was no longer alive, they could say it was all just a rumor, right? They could say he was never even raised from the dead. They just made that up. But people were going to meet Lazarus to hear from him, to meet Mary and Martha, to not just hear the story, but to be a part of it. So they knew they had to put a stop to it. You see, this shows their self-serving heart that leads to hate, that leads to death. So are you inviting others? Are you living a life that invites others to come and see the goodness of God? Or are you inviting them to live a life that invites them to come see your own value in this life, your own accomplishments, your own success? You see, I, I, I think about, like me, I'm a hunt and fishing guy, right? So it's like, you know, do I care more about the rod and reel that I have to show my buddies so they're like all excited that I have this thing, right? My wonderful wife bought me a Benelli. For those of you that are duck hunter, know it's like dream gun, right? Is, is it because I wanted that Benelli because it was going to be a good gun to me and I could drop it in the bay and pull it out and be able to use it? Or was it because I wanted other people to see that I had it? we got to constantly be checking these things. What we do to our homes, what is it? what's the motive behind it? Because ultimately, if you're doing it for, for show, for everybody else to see, they're going to want to be like you, not like Christ. And that's not what we're called to do. What is your motive for all you do? Is it to bring glory to the one true king, the Messiah? The sacrifice that was better than anything else? You see, all that we have and all that we do should be to honor and bring glory to God. And we must find, other way, find ways to point others to him as well. You see, he's better, y'all. He's better. He's better than anything that we could have. And now we're going to transition to the last part of this text that shows us the important part of this message, what I think is the most important piece, and it's how Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. Let's look at it together. And when we look at this, remember, this is what everyone's been waiting for. For centuries, all the writings, everything has been leading up to this moment. This is what everybody's waiting for. It's happening now. 
He kept saying, my time has not yet come, but here we are, y'all. Here we are. We're here. Verse 12, the next day a large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming from Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. And the reason why the crowd went to meet him was they heard he had done the sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So you had an opportunity to go to Israel when I, when I got into the ministry and was ordained into ministry. I got a chance to go with other ministers to Israel, and I actually got to walk the street that many would have entered into Jerusalem. And it was super cool because they helped us to see what it would look like. Like they would have set up tents and merchants and things, and people would have brought things because they were going to be a large gathering of people from all over. So they would want to trade and sell and buy things that they needed for home. And so they would have come there, but they also needed to cleanse themselves before the Passover. And so they would come for a time of preparation. Okay, so we know that there's a lot of people there. Now, this text here leads me and all of us to the fourth point. Value the one who fills life-giving prophecy above all else. You might need to change on your notes a little bit. But value the one who fulfills life-giving prophecy above all else. Because we see here a prophetic fulfillment. We see Jesus entering into Jerusalem on a donkey to the shouts of praise. Now, this, like, as a dad of two little girls, immediately brought Aladdin to my mind. You know, like, when he walks in, it's like, Prince Ali, happy is he? And the elephants are dancing, and the soldiers are marching, and they're all in perfect unison. But that's not how Jesus entered in. He entered in on a donkey's colt. Now, I want to show the prophecy here, so we're going to... Turn to Zechariah chapter 9 if you have your Bibles and want to turn with me. It's not too far back, just a few books back to Zechariah chapter 9. And we're going to read starting in verse 9 to see this prophecy that was made far before. This is one of the writings that the disciples would not have understood right away. And it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. This is why Jesus came, riding on a donkey, to fulfill that prophecy. Another fulfillment of prophecy we see here is from Psalm 118. So Psalm 118 is part of the Hallel. So if you think of hallelujah, there was, there was a section of the Psalms called the Hallel that would have been used, sang, and, and recited at gatherings of Jews. And it would have been Psalm 113 through 118. Okay? So Psalm 113 to 118 would have been the Hillel. And the last part of the Hillel, Psalm 118, says this. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So in verse 25, when it says, save us, we pray, the translation of save us is the same as Hosanna. Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were saying the same thing that was prophesied before in the Hallel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Can you imagine the excitement they would have had? These are people that believed he was the Messiah. They would have been, they bought the palm branches and they're, they're shouting song, songs of praise to Jesus. And he's coming in, seeing this happening, the joy, the hope. But in the midst of this amazing, prophetic, palm-waving party, Jesus knew it would trigger another fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
upon him with the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Christ knew that was a prophecy he was coming to fulfill. In the midst of that joyous moment, Jesus knew this was happening. You feel that tension? Like, as we, as we sing that song, like, Friday's good because Sunday's coming, I was just, like, feeling tension in that. But you and I, most of us know the end of the story. We know what is to come because we've read it, we've heard it. We know that Jesus is the Messiah, and this passage is that affirmation, y'all. John chapter 12 helps us to fully see that he is the king. He's the fulfillment of prophecy. The time is now. The time is now for our king to enter in, to be the sacrifice that you and I needed. So again, value the one who fulfills life-giving prophecy above all else. Jesus is the only one who could fulfill that prophecy. He is the true Messiah sent to save us. Let us not forget the glory of Christ. He's our king. Let us praise him. Give him a hallelujah for the fulfillment of prophecy that saved each of us from our self-serving hearts that would lead us to death. You see, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on a Monday to the praises of the people. But by Friday, the crowd was no longer shouting, Hosanna, but they were shouting, kill him, crucify him. No longer, Hosanna, but crucify him. What a quick shift. You see, the Pharisees said to one another, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They would have saw this entry as a threat to their status, a threat to what they knew, what people saw of them. And they had influence over people, so they took this as a challenge. But God allowed it because he is love. It didn't happen because they found a way to get Jesus to kill him. It happened because God is love, and he was willing to send his son to pay the price. He did that. Jesus did not deserve because of the sins of you and me. So why is Jesus better? He's better because he came riding on a donkey, knowing he will die at the Passover. This would be a Friday he would become the Passover lamb for all of his people. He did not shy away. He came just as it was written. You see, Jesus Jesus came to show the world, I am better. I am better than your sacrificial system, better than your law, Better than anything that you have. I am better. No sacrifice can compare. Jesus is better. He's better because what comes from is eternal. Like, I go and I buy that nice rod and reel, and all it takes is me just closing my tailgate to snap it. Right? It's just temporal. But what Christ gives us is eternal. Jesus is better because there's nothing we can have, no valuable possession, no nard that is greater or more valuable than him. He's better because he changed your and my self-serving heart. Maybe he's in the process of changing it now that was leading us to death. He changes it to a sacrificial heart that leads to us having a resurrected life that glorifies God. He's better because he's the true God. He's the true son of God. He's the true king of Israel, the king of this world. And each of us have the opportunity to be made better by him. Y'all, there's nothing we can have that is greater than Jesus. He's better than the newest iPhone, the fastest printer, the self-driving car, The new Benelli that I've had my eye on, he's better than it, right? There's nothing that we can have that is better. Jesus is better. Let's pray. Lord God, we are grateful that we serve a God who would transform our self-serving hearts. 
who would bring to light what's truly in us and give us that understanding so that we would desire for you to come and change us, to be our upgrade, to make us better. Lord, I pray that these words that we received that help prepare us for what is to come, that they would remain in our hearts, deep in our hearts, and that as we leave this morning, we would meditate on them. And we would say, are we living our life demonstrating and showing others who you are and welcoming them to see that you're better? Giving them an opportunity to taste and see that you are good. Lord God, I pray that you would continue to transform us, to continue to weigh heavy on our hearts, that we would never get complacent and comfortable of where we are, but we would always have our eyes set on you that is worth more than anything we could have. Let us break our alabaster jars, Lord. Let us hold on to not one drop, but Lord, may we give it all to you. In your name we pray, amen.